for the Sunday, as we have told you, marks 45 years since Mount St. Helens erupted, sending ash, lava, mud, and debris flowing down the mountainside. 57 people were killed. To this day, it is still the deadliest volcanic eruption in U.S. history. After all this time, scientists are still watching as parts of the landscape rebound. Meteorologist Leah Pizzetti with our Environment Northwest team traveled to one of the hardest hit areas to see what still has room for growth. Where I'm standing right now was flattened 45 years ago. You can see there's still some tree stumps right here, also some off in the distance beyond me. That's what remains now from the pre eruption. But you can also see there's a lot of greenery around me. That's one of the things that researchers here at Mount St. Helens are so impressed with is just how quickly this is coming back to life. The visuals from 1980 tell the story of destruction. A a mass is 57 lives lost and an entire ecosystem wiped out. When Mount St. Helens erupted, hot ash filled the sky and dumped on surrounding communities. A once dense forest was flattened. Nearly all plant and animal life ended. The eruption itself was different than we would usually think about where a volcano erupts up and out. This one erupted out the front of the volcano, and so the landscape right in front of the volcano was dramatically impacted by that eruption. The eruption turned what was once flat landscape to these hills made up of volcanic debris called hummocks that still stand today. Between them, 150 new ponds formed, many ecosystems that would eventually support new life. In the days and weeks following the eruption, scientists realized that under the blanket of ash, some creatures shockingly survived, like gophers that had burrowed, then played a key part in bringing life back. By burrowing, they can mix in old soil into the new ash that's on the top of the land. That creates conditions in which plants can grow. Donald Brown, lead scientist for Mount St. Helens, says certain plants that could survive in the nitrogen poor area were some of the first signs of life to spring back. Then animals returned, frogs and toads in the first three years. This is a, a red-legged frog. And some species of salamanders nine years after the eruption. All of this without human intervention. When the monument was established in 1982, the goal was to not touch it as much as possible and let the natural system come back to the maximum extent possible. Making these 110,000 acres observation only, letting nature take its course. One of the stories of this place is that it has recovered dramatically faster than anyone guessed it would have. This was a moonscaped landscape when it started and nobody would have guessed that it would look like this 45 years later. But not all life has found its way back. A few salamander species and the coastal tail frog still have not returned, and scientists don't know if or when they will. With a slowdown of new species returning, the focus has now shifted to watching and waiting as the forest returns to its former density, something that will take time. At this point in time, we're seeing the forest come back in. That's what we're watching. That's that's not what it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, even 20 years ago, right? But now that's what we're watching is the forest reestablish finally. King 5's coverage with meteorologist Jeff Renner in 2010 shows the beginning of that process. But King 5 environmental specialist Gary Chittam shows there's been a remarkable resurgence of life. Moss covered, new grasses, new trees, all forming a new forest. And now, 15 years after that, there's still a long way to go. Because this disaster is unprecedented, they don't know how long it will take. Brown is studying this timeline, trying to project potential timing. Best guess today, 60 years. 60 years, I think we're gonna see a mature coniferous forest right here. On this day when we visited, we ran into this group of students. It started to get a little bit unstable with all those earthquakes happening at the same time. Some of the 4,000 that attend Mount St. Helens Institute camps every year. A generation who wasn't alive in 1980 and their parents likely weren't either. They're learning from this evolution. We speak a lot about a large disturbance happening, but then how the landscape and the ecology is really resilient. And that lessons of resilience is a really important like takeaway for our school groups. Carrying all that magma. The idea is to make sure the next generation understands the destructive force of the volcano and the lifetime it's taking to bring the environment back.
we are truly starting from zero. Barely any nutrients to be found anywhere, starting from nothing, turning into this. For Environment Northwest, I'm meteorologist Leah Pizzetti.